What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. Uh, first and foremost, I got to address that I'm wearing my new prized possession. Shout out His Majesty Sir Minty. Um, and second of all, sorry about a bit of delay here. I've been off for a few days, a very, very rare time of being off. I was in Burlington, Vermont for the solar eclipse, which was pretty dope. Uh, but first and foremost, was up there as uh, one of my best friends was getting engaged. Thankfully, she said yes, or that would have been a little bit awkward surprise party after. So that's all good. Uh, just been a bit, just been a bit tired, and and just wanted to be off. So here's MLS five aside week, whatever the hell this is, is uh, it's coming. See you next. A few days delayed, so we're gonna span it forward. And what we're gonna do today is a little game of MLS. Would you rather? More or less, just taking two teams that are similar in the standings and just projecting, hey, which of these two teams would you rather be for the rest of the season? And I wanted to do this in a way to touch on a few of the teams I really haven't hit on. It's like, first of all, apologies to the Western Conference leading Vancouver Whitecaps. I don't think I've talked about them enough on here. So we're going to start with them. Let's go. MLS 5 aside. MLS 5 aside, week seven, number one. Would you rather be the New York Red Bulls or the Vancouver Whitecaps? The tale of the Eastern and Western Conference leading teams at this very, very early stage of the 2024 MLS season. These two have gotten off to a fast start while I was pretty high on, on both of these teams coming into the season. I think it'd be extremely foolish to suggest that myself or really anybody else saw the Red Bulls leading the East or Vancouver leading the West. So while we're nitpicking on which of these two we'd rather be moving forward, let's be sure to say that, like, yeah, this has been a really awesome start for both of these teams. Don't take anything away. I think that these two are pretty clearly going to be top four teams in, in each conference. And maybe not pretty clearly, but... Before I even start dissecting, I want to say I do think that both of these teams are legit. It just depends on how legit and some other circumstances, right? Like, so 14 points after seven games for the Red Bulls. You can see the goals for, goals against. Um, they, they're they pretty in line with their expected goals. Again, it's an early part of the season. This isn't definitive after seven games. Like, the bigger the sample size for expected goals and expected goals against, it's the more accurate picture. So, again, things can change. Things can, you know, skew a small sample size like this. But I just want to point that out. I think it's 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 important information. As for the Whitecaps, 13 points after six message, matches. Same thing in, in terms of you can see their goals and expected goals. As you see, they were overperforming their expected goals by a pretty significant amount. And, again, I don't want to turn this into a negative because good for them for scoring a bunch of goals. But, hey, maybe they're not going to average, you know, two and a half games goals a game, right? Like, but just the, the, these are the numbers and, and for you to make your own uh, opinions. The Red Bulls have the best expected goals against in the East, and I think that's real at this stage of the season. Again, they've had season after season of, of really strong defensive units. They got even better with, with Noah Isla. <laughs> I keep on – I'm going back and forth on how to pronounce his name. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's, but he's been a very good addition to this team. Vancouver, meanwhile, they've returned a lot of their core from year over year, and they were a very good team last year, I thought, right? Like, particularly after they got things figured out during the season uh, under Vanny Sartini and had gone kind of strength to strength. This is These are two good teams, just bottom line. For me, I think that I lean the New York Red Bulls. Um, it's It was difficult. I was going back and forth on this, and honestly, when I started this video, I was just like, screw it. I'll just make a snap decision while I'm talking. So hence a little bit of rambling here. But Vancouver, the pros here are that they have all this continuity. There's a lot of examples and data to point that this is real this is a very good team and and i truly believe that they also have the positive of being in the weaker western conference it should be easier for them to stay towards the top of the conference but for the new why why i i would kind of rather be the new york red bulls i think that their best player is just a little bit better than vancouver's best player in that um emil forsberg and ryan gold and, and ryan gold is a phenomenal player as well please don't don't give me too much hate um but i believe that the red bulls defense is, is going to be better long-term, right? Like, I think that this team can stack up year over year of that strong defensive unit. And I think, again, this is very real. And I think that they finally have an attack that can match that defense or at least, you know, be adequate enough. And when you get to the playoffs, that's very important. So they have the star power and they have that strong defensive unit. They have their identity. And so I'd lean Red Bulls. That's not to say that the White Cabs defense is bad. That's not to say that the White Caps don't have a chance like moving forward. Like these are two of the, the best teams in the league right now. And I'm just going to slightly lean to the Red Bulls. Please don't kill me, White Caps fans. MLS 5 aside, number two. Let's go from the top of the table to the bottom. FC Dallas, San Jose Earthquakes. These two teams can be lumped together both by their very slow starts and the fact that they have two managers who used to be on Greg Berhalter's staff as assistants to the U.S. national team. Start with Dallas. They have four points after six matches, six goals, four, ten against. 
Um, we, we've talked plenty about their difficulties this year and, and last year, honestly, under Nico Estevez. Uh, and San Jose Earthquakes, they have three points after seven games. That's one win and six losses. Uh, 17 goals against is not a great number, uh, particularly given that the, the, the strengths of this team is supposed to be in defense and, and the worries were whether or not the attack was going to be good enough. Um, so that's been a bit of a surprise. Look, both of these teams have a lot of problems. Dallas just doesn't ever seem like they're playing to the best of their potential. Like ever, like last, dating back to last year, coming to this year, even when they're picking up points, particularly last year, it just felt a little off. It felt like, oh, they grinded through a result that maybe they did, they shouldn't have needed to grind through. They are good at controlling the game with possession, but that possession turns to be sideways and it turns to be ponderous and slow and, and it just makes for boring games and, and doesn't translate to domination that you know if you have the ball you're trying like the columbus crew hold a lot of possession and they try to go forward with it dallas has been a lot more side to side and that hasn't been good enough i thought i got fooled again by this team man i thought the back three was going to change things peter you know you, you change the system you put a 10 million dollar center forward ahead of jesus Ferrer. you got alan velasco coming back in the summer um i thought it was going to look much better than it has and i fell for it again right i'm 0 for 2 on my last two uh dallas optimisms and then for san jose this is, you know, I didn't know if they were going to be bottom of the table, but I didn't expect them to be all that much better, right? Like, this team is so very clearly missing a DP attacking midfielder. This team so very clearly just doesn't have enough talent in the attack. Like, Christian Espinosa is, is a very good player. Jeremy Bobasi is a good center forward. Amal Pellegrino, you know, there's some upside there, right? Like, but none of those guys, like, if, if any one of those three are your best attacker, you're probably not a playoff team. Like, I, I hate to be blunt and I hate to be binary with this. It just is what it is. And the defense... Daniel st stood on his head last year. He covered up a lot of cracks. He got injured this year. The The defensive unit is not the same. Look, I mean, not to pin all of this on, on the goalkeeper, but 17 goals against with um, 8.4 expected goals against is not great. So um, I'm pretty down on Dallas too, but I would probably take Dallas, even though I think Nico Estevez, his seat is absolutely red hot um, from the people I've talked to and from my own assumptions, right? I would still take this Dallas team because I just think that there's a lot more talent. A starting point in the attack of Peter Musa and Jesus Ferreira with Alan Velasco coming back at some point in the summer is really strong. And Kosi Tafari, I think, is the best center back out of either of these groups, even though the, the uh, San Jose defenders would be like 2, 3, 4, 5. Like, he doesn't have a partner. I just think that there's so much more talent on this Dallas team. And again, probably falling for it once again, but I would rather be Dallas than San Jose moving forward. MLS 5 aside, number 3, Nashville SC, CF Montreal. Each are on 7 points. Um, Nashville has played seven games, one win, four draws, and two losses. Montreal has played six games, two wins, one draw, and three losses. The, the key caveat here is CF Montreal have played all of their games on the road. Um, the top line for this one is Nashville has better top-end talent. Hani Mukhtar is an MVP candidate. There is nobody on Montreal that you could put anywhere near that, right? And, and that's just kind of a fact, of, and that shows Hani's quality. Um, Walker Zimmerman would be the best defender on either of these teams. So you look at that, they have a dominant attacker, a don dominant defender. I'd take Montreal because I think that the collective is much better. I think Laurent Coutois is co coaching circles around Gary Smith this year, right? Like the whole thing that I've been saying in in positive around Gary Smith and like trying to push back at the, at the fair criticisms of this team's play style, of this team not really ever taking the next step into like the attacking phase of play is, yeah, sure, that's fair, but... They win games. They get points. They get to the playoffs. Like, would you rather be 12th and play the game the right way, air quote, or would you rather be 4th and have a chance at, at every knockout tournament? Like, I'd take the latter, as frustrating as it could be. The problem with that is, if the results ain't coming, that is a short leash, right? Like, oh, th there is no pushback to the criticisms right now, right? In Nashville's defense, Walker Zimmerman has been injured most of the season. Maybe that explains the defense, but I think the defense has been so bad that I don't think that Walker just solves this. I'm perplexed. This team gives up so many goals on set pieces this year. I don't understand. A team that plays like this and has this identity has to be killers on defensive and attacking set pieces. That's how you win in the margins, and that's how you gain an edge when you're not creating a ton of chances or when you're not doing enough to break down a set defense in, in the final third, when you're chasing a goal or when you're when you're level and, and when they know your plan A is Hani Mukhtar in transition. Um, I've been disappointed, right? It's early in the season. Things can turn around. But for me, Montreal over Nashville, that's who I'd rather be for the rest of the season. Um... Mate uh, Kokoro, Yankov, all of these players that they have an attack. Like the the fun part about Montreal is, honest God, there's probably 20 players that that you could put in and around what you could call their best 11. Like Joseph Martinez might be their best forward. 
or he could play with Kokoro, or he could be on the bench. So when a Poku gets back, he could play. Yankov hasn't played, but then it's like you could play with three more box to box type central midfielders if you need to tweak things, or like the wing backs, all this stuff, center backs. They have so many good players. The delta between their like worst starting caliber player and and best star is not that wide. And soccer is a weak link sport. As much as I talk about knockout tournaments, you need but your best players to be your best players. Of course, they need their their best players to be special moments as well. But over the course of a season, soccer is a weak link sport. That means it's more important that your worst player is is better than it is that your best player is the best, right? The NBA, basketball, that's a strong link sport. You just roll the ball to LeBron, you roll the ball to Luka Doncic, Jalen Brunson, and you just say, go go win us a game, right? Like, that's that's NBA versus soccer is a weak link sport. And Montreal, I think, are, are, are going... Are, again, I think that this is legit. It's going to be a very difficult playoff race. I think that Montreal are going to get in. MLS 5 aside, number four, back to the Western Conference. Real Salt Lake, Minnesota United. Real Salt Lake has 11 points after seven games, three wins, two draws, and two losses. Minnesota United, perhaps one of the most pleasant surprises in the league this year, 13 points after six matches, three wins, two draws, and a loss. For me, I'd still take Real Salt Lake. I think that their top-end talent is better. I think that their mid-level talent is better. I think that they have less question marks. They're more established. And I want to say that they should be. Minnesota United, remember, they started the season without a head coach. They started the season with a sporting director who wasn't here yet, and we didn't know when they were coming, or started preseason without that, right? They started, a lot of people, like, I, my first power rankings in January, I had them 29th, right? Like, I'm an idiot. So, like, this isn't a knock on Minnesota. This is a wonderful start. I just don't think that it's real, right? You can look at the expected goals numbers, and, and I know Minnesota's can be skewed a bit by one game here or there, uh, particularly that game against Orlando, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head. Um, and, and they've picked up points. They've been, they've been better than I think that their expected difference, uh, goal difference shows. Um, but they're not as good. I don't think as the point total that they've racked up. And again, nothing's wrong with that. That's not a negative. It's just, if we're projecting forward, I'd rather be Real Salt Lake. I think that Real Salt Lake's attack makes a ton of sense. I think that they have a lot of good players like Pablo Ruiz being out hurts, man. I feel so bad for him. He's one, a, a delightful player to watch. He's one of the better, more underrated defensive mids in the league particularly because he's been out for more or less, like, I, I don't remember, did he play one, maybe two games this year after being injured halfway through last season? Like, it sucks, man. Like, watching him play, he's very important to that team. But they've been able to weather the storm. They figured it out down the stretch last year. They struggled a lot without him originally. Um, they got better as towards the end of the season and figuring out how to play without him. And they've, I like I think that they're good in that sense this year. Um, again, Chicho Rongo is an elite talent in this league. They can, and I believe will, add a DP in this summer, but we'll see. And, and Paul Tenorio did a, did a great job breaking down the rule changes that are coming as well, so maybe some more stuff will happen. Um, Minnesota, we got to Emmanuel Manuel Reynoso, Reynoso again. Um, he's in Argentina. He just missed a, um, a green card meeting, and it looks like Minnesota United are over it. And this is also why like, a lot of people I talked to thought they should have tried to move on from him in the winter. That was kind of the refrain I heard from a lot of people like, hey, he came back, he played well, and it's tantalizing to think of, you know, hey, if, if he's right, if he's here, if he's totally bought in, everything else, he's an elite talent in this league, it's tough, and like, you spent $5 million for him, even with that good half season after coming back from going AWOL the first time, you're not going to get $5 million back from him, $2.5 million would be better than nothing right now, right, like, um, this... This is just a really sad, disappointing situation. Minnesota seemed to be over it. Um, CSL Khaled El Hamad pretty much was like, we're just focusing on the players that are here. And now Eric Ramsey is just something that he has to answer to as well. So in hindsight, it's easy to say they probably should have tried to move on from Reynoso in the winter. Who knows how this one gets resolved. If it gets resolved, maybe they'll have a DB spot open if, if Reynoso is no longer here, whether that's um, a voided contract or, or a, a transfer to South America. Who knows? Whatever, right? Like... We'll see. Um, I'm kind of sick of talking about the Reno show again. Um, and this can't really happen twice, right? Like, so, um, again, but Minnesota have shown that they have, they've done all of this this year, more or less without him. And he doesn't really fit into the high pressing, high energy transition soccer that they want to play under Eric Ramsey. So, hey, maybe this will work out and they can bring in a DP that, that'll fit much better. And hey, a DP that'll just show the hell up to, to Minnesota. What a crazy concept, right? MLS 5 aside, number 5, last one, back to the Eastern Conference. A pair of two teams with 10 points, Toronto FC and DC United. Both of these teams also have in common that they were projected, you know, 15th and 14th in, in some order by very, very many people around the league heading into this season. They both played seven games. Um, DC United have a better attack and better expected goals, all that stuff. Toronto FC 
probably have the higher end talent, top end talent when healthy, but obviously Lorenzo Tini is injured. Uh, for me, this is a pretty easy one. I'd take DC United. Um, if you asked me three weeks ago, I probably would have taken Toronto because I thought that their early defensive performances were more real than fake, and they haven't lived up to that. And then Lorenzo and Senior got injured, right? Like the cracks have started to appear. And again, these are probably obvious ones, right? Like that, not saying that this, like that, that was just a bad take by me, probably, right? Like, so I think DC United are legitimately good. Christian Benteke, I've been saying it since the day he was signed. There were some criticisms of over the price or whatever, how he fits, the age, or like he's got a singular talent in this league uh, in terms of his aerial ability, hold up play, like, and he scores a bunch of goals, like, pretty obvious. And he could fit in this uh, pressing system with Troy Lazane. I, I like what they've done a lot. I was very wrong about DC United coming into the season. I looked at a lack of talent. Um, but again, the continuity of having the correct system, what Ali Mackay has done in his first season as, as general manager and leading this new front office in getting rid of a lot of players who doesn't make sense to what Troy Lizan wanted to play and bringing in a bunch who did. That continuity is so important because the top line vision, when it's all aligned, means that even if you don't hit go you know 10 out of 10 on a signing the floor is so much higher because you're narrowing down the pool of players based on these are the three principles four principles that a player a center forward or a left winger or a center back or or a right wing back need to have in our game model and so again even if you don't identify the 10 out of 10 target the absolute superstar player the baseline is going to be so much higher. The floor is going to be so much higher because you're looking at players that want to play your system. DC United's biggest problem over the last decade, honestly, or, or you know, towards the end of Ben Olsen, Ben Olsen into Lazada, into Wayne Rooney, into now, is every 18 months they changed an idea. It was like, oh, here comes Hernan Lazada. We're going to go all out to playing three at the back and high pressing and getting players um, who are going to play like that. And then Wayne Rooney comes in, no, we're going to play mid block. Um, and actually, we need to trade Julian Gressel and, and move on so we can make room to bring in more additions. And then they signed Christian Benteke. And, like, it would have been nice to have Julian Gressel with Christian Benteke, right? And then it's like, okay, how? Well, maybe we want to be possession or, okay. And then now Rooney leaves and now Lazane came, comes in. And Ali McKay, like, looked at the, the options and, and everything else he could do with this roster. He's, like, you know, trying to move on from as much as he can to create the room to just, this is the vision moving forward and this is how we're going to play and we can overturn the roster quicker. And rather than say, hey, even if Troy Lazane leaves in a year, if this is the vision, then you just bring in another head coach that, um, wants to play this style, and then it's much easier to transition and move on. So, well done to DC United and Ali McKay early on. Troy Lizane, everybody else. Uh, this doesn't mean that I think Toronto is awful, but I was probably too high on them a, a few weeks ago, and, and I think this one's an easy. All right, that'll do it. Um, be back in a couple of days, maybe. I don't know. I'm supposed to, you know, actually start working again on, on Saturday with, with the MLS games. Um, we'll see, whatever. Got a bunch of ideas moving forward. We'll see uh, what comes up next, what shakes out. Um, transfer window still open in MLS. Little known fact here. Uh, I don't know how much more movement there's going to be, but we'll kind of see how things shake out. Whatever. Fun time. Moving forward.